a great big welcome to you on this 15th Sunday of Pentecost as we gather as God's people. Yes, I know some are in their respective homes. Uh, some of you are in your jammies, <laughs> sipping your coffee, watching the service, and we're just glad you're with us. And there'll be some who will be meeting the church on Sunday. But together, we continue to be God's people, and we thank God for each and every one of you. A little, about the, a little bit about the service today. I'm dealing with the second part of the gospel, which uh, tells about Jesus healing a man who's uh, deaf. And he ables to, he's able to touch his ears and uh, bring about healing uh, to his speak, his speaking and to his, uh, his listening. Uh, but he does it in such a way that he does not want to draw attention to it. He pulls him aside privately and does it for people not to know. And then he goes beyond that by telling people, tell no one about what has taken place today. And I used to scratch my head going, but Lord, don't you want your message to get out? He does but not in a way that's sensationalism. He's not trying to uh, um, you know, get people coming like it's to a circus, but I believe he wants the message to go out through his, uh, his disciples. And today we are those disciples, that we too can carry that message in a very loving and, and uh, gentle and, uh, and um, uh, very guided way by the Spirit uh, to those people that uh, are yearning to know about the love of God and discover that for their own hearts and lives. I share some stories, some illustrations. I hope you find that helpful uh, as we continue to learn how to be the hands and the feet of our Lord in bringing the message of God's love and the gospel to the world around us. So I hope this uh, service today is uh, helpful for you. Please know our love and prayers continue to be with each of you. And so at this time, uh, let's begin the service in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And let me open with the, uh, the prayer of the day. And so to you, O oh God, our strength. Without you, we are weak. We are wayward creatures. The Lord, protect us from all dangers that attack us from the outside. And Lord, cleanse us from all evil that arises from within ourselves. That we, as your people, may be preserved through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Again, thank you for joining us. I now turn the service over to our... Uh, uh, to our music team as they share the gifts of music. God bless you. i 
gospel this day is from the seventh chapter of the Gospel of Mark, beginning with verse 24. From there Jesus set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there, yet he could not escape notice. Well, but a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Though the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin, she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it's not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And then he said to her, For saying that, you may go. Your demon has left your daughter. So she went home, found the child lying on the bed, and the demon gone. And Jesus returned from the region of Satyri, went by the way of Sidon toward the Sea of Galilee to the region of the Decapolis. And they brought to him a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. He took him aside in private, away from the crowd, and put his fingers into his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Yephaphatha, that is, be opened. Immediately his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. And Jesus ordered them to tell no one. But the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They were astounded beyond measure, saying, He's done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. The Gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. And so grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. And so let us pray. Lord, we thank you again as we gather as your people, and yes, uh, still in our respective homes, and some are in the sanctuary. But Lord, wherever we are, together, we are your people. And so, Lord, I ask that you come now and fill the hearts and lives of your people. I pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleased in your sight. And this I pray. Amen. Well, since the football season is about to begin, I thought you might enjoy this tale of a most unusual game. You see, a funny thing happened at the football stadium. After taking the opening kickoff, the home team went into a huddle, as usual, to get the formation from the quarterback and to encourage one another. But then came the unusual. The team did not break out of the huddle to move into action. Soon the red flag was dropped and the referee stepped off a five-yard penalty for delay of game. What happened, or should I say did not happen next, will be discussed for years. The team still did not leave the huddle. They seemed to be talking among themselves and encourage one another, but it appeared they had forgotten that the object of the game is to move to the line and carry the ball across the goal. Again, the red flag went down. Another five-yard penalty. The crowd howled. At this team, the team was overheard, talking about ways to improve the appearance of the huddle. As the crowd watched with amusement, the team changed the shape of the huddle from a circle to a triangle and then to a square but they never left the huddle to move into action. Their coach watched them with a hurt look on his face. Then several players moved out of the huddle up to the line. They wanted to get into the game, but their teammates just would not join them. So they returned to the huddle to try and persuade the team to move towards the goal. And the talking continued. Another red flag, another penalty. The amusement of the crowd gave way to frustration and then to anger. First they pleaded and then they booed. But the team kept talking in the huddle and patting each other on the back. Then came the unbelievable conclusion. The referee ruled that the home team had forfeited the game and he awarded the victory to its opponent. The crowd filed out of the stands, but the home team still in the huddle, still talking, did not seem to notice that the stadium was now empty. Well, here we are, folks, so to speak, and we are in that huddle again. And that's important. You see, in the huddle of Christian worship is where we receive support, encouragement, and instruction. Newspaper Tennessee, uh, in a Nashville, Tennessee newspaper, carried a tongue-in-cheek story about a Mrs. Lila Craig who hadn't missed attending church in over a thousand Sundays, although she's in her 80s. Editor commented that it makes one wonder, what is the matter with Mrs. Craig? Doesn't it ever rain or snow in her town on Sunday? Doesn't she ever have unexpected company? And doesn't she ever beg off to attend picnics or have headaches or colds or nervous spells or tired feelings? Doesn't she ever oversleep or need time to read her Sunday newspaper? 
Hasn't she ever become angry at the minister or had her feelings hurt by someone who just felt justified in staying home to hear a good sermon on the radio or TV? What is the matter with Mrs. Craig anyway? Well, my guess is that Mrs. Craig has found something in the huddle that is important to her life. It may be the fellowship. It may be the instruction or the liturgy. Or heaven forbid, it may even be the preaching. You see, the huddle is important. But the huddle is not the game. The game is how we live in the world. The game is our witness to what Christ has done in our lives. Someone brought to Jesus a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment and asked Jesus to lay his hand upon him and heal him. And taking him aside from the multitude privately, Mark tells us that Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears and he spat and touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And the man's ears were opened and his tongue was released and he spoke plainly. Notice those words and he take, and taking him aside from the multitude privately. You see, there are no crutches lining the ceiling where Jesus preached. There was no newspaper ad saying, come, expect a miracle. There was no one over to the side hawking prayer towels. Jesus was not interested in becoming a celebrity. In fact, after Jesus healed this man, he charged them to tell no one. What is the matter with Jesus? Doesn't he understand public relations? <laughs> Doesn't he understand advertising? Press agents and other publicity people, they're under constant pressure to invent ways to get their clients noticed by the public. Didn't Jesus understand the importance of showbiz? What's the matter with him? Didn't he want his message out into the world? Of course he did. And immediately before he left his disciples, he instructed them to take the gospel message and to take it to the very ends of the earth. Jesus wanted to get the message out. That is why he came into the world. But there's a couple of things about getting the message out that I believe we need to see. First and foremost, I believe authentic Christian faith sells itself. You see, Christian faith doesn't require hype, doesn't require sens sensationalism, does not require us to make nuisances out of ourselves with our neighbors. We do not need to put on the hard sell when it comes to Christian faith. Notice what happens in the story from Mark's gospel. Jesus charged them, charged them to tell no one. But the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. The truth of the matter is that Christ could not be hidden. When you find someone who could do the things that Jesus did, people, let's face it, they're going to tell about it. When you find people who live like he lived, others are going to notice. In 1956, five missionaries traveled to Ecuador to bring the gospel to the people of the Hirani tribe. These five men by the name of Nate Saint, Jim Elliott, Roger Yoderin, Ed McCulley, and Peter Fleming, thought they had made contact with a friendly, welcoming group. But not long after they landed in Ecuador, a group from this native tribe attacked uh, the five men and killed all five. And even though the missionaries were armed, they did not fight back. The story of the men's murder touched countless people. But even more moving was the decision by Nate's sister, Rachel, and Jim Elliott's wife, Elizabeth, to move to Ecuador to minister to the people who had killed their loved ones. Steve Saint was just a small child when his father, Nate, was murdered. He moved to Ecuador with his aunt, where he was raised among the Hirani people. He was taught to love the people of this tribe as his brothers and as his sisters. But years later, as an adult, Steve felt compelled to return to Ecuador to speak to the men who had committed the murders. He wanted to know the last details of his father's life. And he wanted to hear from them why they did it. And here's what he learned. He learned that in 1955, the year before the missionaries came, major oil companies were trying to close in on the Hirani land. They were often ruthless in their efforts to drive away the indigenous people. Naturally, the Hirani people were suspicious of any white people who approached them. Thus, they attacked and killed the five missionaries. Why did they also kill Rachel Saint and Elizabeth Elliot when these two women arrived later? It was because many of the people of the tribe had questions questions of their own about the murders, and they thought the women could answer them. For example, many of the men involved in the attack claimed to see lights, lights that were high above the trees during the attack. The woman who witnessed the attack reported seeing people high above the trees singing. Yes, I said singing. Later, when Rachel Saint played a tape recording of a choir singing, the woman claimed that these were the same sounds that she heard high above those trees. 
But the most puzzling thing for the Irani people was why the five men had not fought back when they were attacked. It was only after Rachel and Elizabeth told them the story of Jesus, who allowed himself to die for the sake of others, that this mystery was cleared up. Rachel and Elizabeth acted as nurses and translators among the Hirani people, piecing together a Bible translation in their own language. The men who committed the murders are all believers in Christ now. And in 1995, Steve Saint and his family settled in Ecuador to live among the Hirani people and to build a hospital there. Steve's desire was to carry on the work that his father once dreamed of doing. You see, when you have people living out their faith like that, the gospel, it doesn't need any hype. The gospel message sells itself. And that brings us to the second thing that we need to see. And that is that authentic Christian lives are the best advertising for our faith. Other forms of advertising faith can be confusing. You ever been cut off in traffic by someone with a honk if you love Jesus bumper sticker? <laughs> may have honked, but at that particular moment, loving Jesus, I suspect, was not what was on your mind. You know, there's nothing wrong with religious bumper stickers. But once you put a sticker like that on your car, you got to make sure you're driving in a Christ-like way, yes? Otherwise, it's just really confusing. But what is not confusing is when we live our lives with the integrity, the love, and the self-giving of Jesus Christ. We don't have to be loud about it. All we need to be is consistent. And then in the early 1800s, England underwent a revolution. It was not violent like the one that happened during the same era in France. The revolution in England ushered in a period during which there was an explosion of institutions that were committed to the education and to the assistance of the poor. Behind the revolution was a spiritual renewal in which many men and women came to understand what it meant to follow Christ. One little known but significant factor in this revolution was the role of England's nannies. The women who were usually from the poorer families. They were hired by the upper classes to care for children. We see many of these nannies were followers of Christ, and they taught the children about Jesus. They also influenced the wives of England's elite. These women in turn began to expose their husbands to what they were learning. And the result? Laws were passed in Parliament, and organizations were founded that made a great difference in the English way of life. Society became more tolerant and more supportive of the poor and the downcast. And much of it can be attributed to the nannies who worked behind the scenes doing what they knew Christ had called them to do. Was that revolution the product of a lot of noisy hype? No, not at all. It was just quiet and sincere living. And that is what Christ desires out of us, to live our lives as his emissaries in this world in which we live. Well, folks, it's nearing that time when we break out of the huddle and we head back out into the playing field. So it's my prayer that as God's people, that we let the real game begin. And I pray it may be so. And all God's people said, Amen. God bless you.
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And so we come to that part of the service that we are calling spiritual communion. We miss the comfort of Jesus the Christ, Lord and Savior, brother and companion, who comes to us in, with, and under the forms of bread and wine during communion. From the depths of the reality of heaven, we are loved. So spiritual communion is a trust and an awareness, a prayer and an acceptance. God's love is really present, even when we can only be as present as our screens allow. I believe God's grace can work through and transcend electronic communication. Through our spiritual communion, the reality of Jesus and the Father's love, in and through the Holy Spirit is operating and present in our hearts and in our minds. And so let us pray. I believe that you are truly present in the sacrament of Holy Communion. Lord, I love you above all things, and I long for you in my soul. Since I cannot receive you in the sacrament of your body and blood, come spiritually into my heart. Cleanse and strengthen me with your grace, and let me never be separated from you. O oh Lord, may I live in you, and you in me, in this life and in the life to come. And all God's people said, Amen. And so again, we want to thank you for joining us this day. We hope this service today has been helpful in your Christian journey. Please know our love and prayers are with each and every one of you. And again, if we can ever be of any help, uh, do, do not hesitate to call us or email us at the church office. And so receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. God bless you.